God, we're uh, we're so thankful to have this avenue to come together to study your word and uh, with all the challenges that we've been faced with over the past few weeks of having our church family together, we we just um, appreciate this the tools that you've provided us with to be able to be together. Pray that uh, you'll continue to bless uh, Kobe and Lisa as they prepare the next few weeks to get all their stuff packed up and head to Texas and just uh, uh, be with the kids and and help them uh, to manage the move as well, knowing they're leaving friends behind and uh, coming to a new place. And we just just pray that you'll you'll guide their family each day to through through the steps that come. God, I pray that you'll be with us in our study tonight, that we we put away the cares of the world and we focus on your word and, uh, and we listen to the word as it's read and uh, and understand it so that we can apply it and, and share it with others. God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus, for the sacrifice that he made that gives us eternal life. We thank you for the gift of your spirit to guide our step. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, we've been uh, jumping around quite a bit over the past several weeks from different passages of uh, Scripture, but I will say there is a method to my madness. Uh, first two weeks, we looked at boldness, um, but then... Last week, with the walk, Jesus and the washing of the feet, I wanted to tie in together how boldness isn't just boldness that necessarily looks bold. Sometimes some of the boldest things we can do is humble service of, yeah, wrapping the towel around our waist like our Lord and uh, doing something very much out of the ordinary, but not something proud, but rather something very self-sacrificial. And springboarding off of that, I wanted to look at a way in the New Testament, uh, the early church, the first century church, how they had to struggle to find ways to, I think, I kind of connect this to washing of the feet, um, that some of their disputes where they uh, didn't see eye to eye on some things um, and struggled with how to apply their faith in the context in which they live, which we're still struggling with today. and always have and always will, but you know, the guiding principle here in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 10, where we're going to be, is um, how do we regard each other, and how do we put the emphasis on how do we help others, rather than just wanting it done the way that maybe even seem, makes the most sense to us, uh, but rather um, having that servant mentality and that servant heart. So that's where we're going to be is 1 Corinthians chapter 8, um, and then a little bit of chapter 10, too, with uh, this issue of food sacrifice to idols, which seems strange to us, but this was one of the bigger issues of the early church. I mean, it comes up here in Corinthians, it comes up in Romans, it comes up in the book of Acts, it comes up in the book of Revelation. Um, it is a, it was a widespread issue because you had a people, a church, living amidst the Roman Empire that showing up at temples and having a feast to a certain God, eating the food sacrifice to idols was uh, like showing up to a civic center for us today. I mean, it's how you interacted with people in your community. Um, it was all based on their religions and how does a Jew uh, do that? How does a Gentile Christian do that? And those all come into play in this very delicate issue and we face some delicate issues too, obviously, where different points of view are very different, are very uh, varying, and sometimes even at odds. But I think Paul helps us give us a way forward. And like these verses are probably fairly familiar to you. Uh, I think they're rightfully focused on. But uh, I think in the context of boldness and service, we see how that boldness is directed toward how can I help take care of other people and watch over them and do what's best for them uh, rather than just push what I think is right and that's normally how we might think about boldness but Paul flips that for us and wrote in first Corinthians chapters 8 and 10 because uh, I think Paul the very bold Paul is actually saying uh, 
you lay down what you are entitled to on behalf of, uh, for the sake of someone else. And that's actually a bold step in and of itself. So, uh, and how we bear with the weak. And that's what we're getting into here. The idea that not everybody sees things the same. And some might be spiritually mature and spiritually strong. Uh, but some might be spiritually weak and spiritually immature. How do we mesh those together? And Paul's basic thrust is Jesus's basic thrust. Well, you love each other. Uh, and I think that's uh, yeah, a timeless lesson for us. But um, having said that, somebody want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 3? I can do that. Now about sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. Thank you. So as he gets into this issue of food sacrifice to idols, he frames it in this issue of well, uh, who's right? And I think that's a big issue for us. Who's right? And that's been a big issue for religion, or for Christianity, and other religions too, but Christianity for centuries and centuries. And, and we try to go to the Bible to figure out what's right. Well, in this passage, Paul is actually emphasizing that it's not necessarily about being right. Uh, that that's not what this Christian community we have is built on. It's let's find the person who's the most right and do things the right way. Uh, rather, uh, he emphasizes where he's going with knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And I guess what examples have you seen of that being true? Um, what instances where do you think that applies to our current situation, any situation that we're faced in, just the human nature. Uh, how does knowledge, how have you seen knowledge puff up, but love, servant love, I think, build up? Well, the, the negative side of it is, you know, you see a lot of churches that have divided over the issue of you know who's right who has the greatest knowledge and who's and, and you see so much division and and people that you know can't worship together because they can't agree on things so i mean that's the one of the big negatives to it obviously um people get to the point where they think they've got a monopoly on knowledge of the scripture or whatever they're talking about and then they they don't listen so that's the the big negative to it okay. well and i think that's this chapter 8 verse 1 is referring to that my translation has with regard to food sacrifice to idols we know that quote unquote and it puts in quotations we all have knowledge and the footnote here in my translation says that Paul is kind of uh, <laughs> throwing a phrase they've been using back at them. It's like, you know, you're so smart. You've got it figured out. You've got the answers. You have this knowledge. But let me tell you something. That's not what Christianity is about. Love, knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. And, uh, you know, just thinking about, and I would say our Church of Christ heritage, but it wasn't just Church of Christ. I mean, back in the 1800s, especially early 1900s, debates were huge. Um, you know, we didn't have television to keep us occupied. And so the thing to do in town might go to see, well, who's debating who? And uh, and are some of our early uh, American leaders within the movement, the restoration movement uh, that impacted our Churches of Christ so much? Uh, were well-known debaters, and they became well-known debaters, and that's kind of the the the, uh, the 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 identity that they created for themselves, the reputation that they garnered amongst uh, other people, and some of them, yeah, were very good at making their points. And 
whenever I was young, going to Bible classes or whatever, sometimes it was almost put in, you need to learn this so that you can prove to people that this is the right way. And that's how I was even like trained. Uh, and, and, and that's still a big part of some of the even formal training that preachers still get. Um, whereas, and not that it's not good to obviously desire the truth and desire, and desire what is right and try to be as correct and align up our lives with scripture as much as we can. I mean, it doesn't say knowledge is bad, but if you're going simply to be right, mm -hmm. and all you're doing is puffing up, you, your knowledge has to be coupled or really, I think, subservient to love. It can't be knowledge and then love. It's got to be love and then knowledge. Um, that because love edifies, love increases, lo love builds bridges, love changes hearts. I mean, even in the idea of debating, um, you read those famous debates from the 1800s and early 1900s, or you even see political debates. And you know who wins a political debate? <laughs> Whatever party you're a part of has won that. You know, I mean, if you're a Republican, a Republican candidate won the debate. If you're a Democrat, the Democratic candidate won the debate. You hear the things that reinforce your view, and you say, yeah, stick it to them. And our Facebook arguments go very much the time. I don't know of any argument that has been won over Facebook as far as people pushing out their ideas, saying, you have to believe it my way because my way is the correct way. And they'll fight and argue, but I've never seen someone go, oh, you're right. Um, that's just not how debates work, and that's not how our human nature necessarily works. And the, the pursuit to be right, I think, kind of always ends there, like you're saying, Craig, that we, uh, uh, we want to know that we're the right ones, but if there's a truth, I guess, that I've learned is that I'm at least a little bit wrong. I'm probably a lot more wrong than I realize I am. I mean, that's the nature of being wrong. You don't know you are uh, until you are confronted with it in an undeniable way and hope, even then some people hold on to the wrongness uh, but uh, and so I, we trust in being right and i would say that these arguments that happen sometimes come because we're trusting in our rightness and yet what paul is going to get it into is uh, love is so much a better way of dealing with the tensions and the problems you have because if it's just being right, those problems aren't going away. You're going to keep arguing until, yeah, you're dead and blue in the face. So, hey, Colby, uh, I noticed Ward had his hand up. I think a couple David? times. So, Sorry. David, I go to Matthew chapter twenty-three, twenty-three, verse twenty-three. Chapter twenty-three, Jesus verse twenty-three. Says, Woe to you, teachers of the law. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. He says, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So here's where I go when I hear your scripture is, it's not that we do one or the other. Yeah, exactly. It's, and I think they're this way, and that's because I think different than everybody else. <laughs> but I think <laughs> this way, if you're all love and no truth, you still disappoint God, and you're still disobeying God. If you're all truth but without love, you will gain nobody. You'll, you'll win no souls with truth only and no love. And so I see that they are equally balanced and they complement each other. I agree. Whereas you know, the scripture Jesus says, you should have kept on doing the tithing and giving of your spence, uh, your dill and mint and cumin. You should still do that, but you also should so, show justice, mercy and faithfulness. So he, uh, the scripture is never one way is it. It's always added truth and love and faith in all equal. 
I yeah. don't think anyone, well, there again, you'll throw out, but the greatest of these is love. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Some of you uh, are thinking that verse. <laughs> here's the way I think of it. Um, David, you as convinced far me. As, uh, here's the way I think of it is truth devoid of love actually isn't truth because God is the God of truth. That's who right. defines what true is, and his truth is love. I mean, and God is love, and God is truth both, and, and the two cannot be separated. And the same way, I think, with love is that if we are truly desiring to love God and love each other, we're going to be imperfect, but we're going to be abiding in the truth of what matters most in the eyes of God and desiring to Get to, and here's the way I think about uh, being right is it's a whole lot healthier to be in the process of learning how to become right than to think that I carry right. around right in my back pocket and I yes, am, have the yes, monopoly on truth, like Craig said. And yes, uh, that's dangerous territory to think that you've got to figure it out. Uh, but the loving person, I think, I think that's an, an aspect of love and humility is that I'm not going to go into a situation or a conversation with the assumption of, I'm right, you're wrong. Right. That, 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 that is not even truth devoid of love. To me, that's not even truth because you don't have your eyes open to see what really matters. And so, yeah, I agree that I, I think you, to try to pull them apart uh, and to say that they're separate from each other is actually missing what godly truth is all about and also missing what godly love is about because godly love incorporates truth. And godly truth is based on and, you know, shows and expresses right. love. Right. Um, I agree with you, David, uh, even though I would still raise that one hand a little bit higher. <laughs> but but I, th I think they're intertwined, <laughs> and, and we should see them as intertwined. And maybe that might mean we have to redefine what we think of love and redefine what we think of truth, uh, because the, both of them are grounded in the example and character of God. Like He made what is true, and, right. which means he set the laws of science and nature in motion, uh, but also he said, you know, um, Treat each other as you want to be treated. That, that's every bit as true as, right? Um, as you know, E equals MC squared, or you know, two plus two is four. However deep in the science and math we want to go. But anyway, that's how I, I think that they should go together, and we should keep them tied together. And here, but I think Paul emphasizes, you know, knowledge puffs up, love builds up, but. He says, focus on the right kind of knowledge. And that's where he goes at the end of verse two. Yes, sir. At the end of verse three, I'm sorry. Yes, like, if somebody, if, but if someone loves God, he is known by God. You know, that known knowledge. You know, it's not a matter of us just thinking, I have a knowledge of God. I've got to figure it out. It's, have I put myself in a place where God knows me, where I am known by God? And, um, and that's, so he's trying to reframe our thinking a little bit, I think. Um, and this will help solve the issue at hand because the issue at hand is one group thinks they're right and thinks that they can, you know, do what they know to be right. And Paul even affirms, yeah, you're right. But this food sacrifice, I will stop. But uh, that rightness does not somehow supersede love. As a matter of fact, uh, it needs to be in tandem with it. Uh, so, okay, Roger. Yeah, KT and, and mentioned earlier, but when you think about when you're in a discussion with someone, the first problem we have is we don't really listen to what they're saying to comprehend. And most of the time when we get agreement, our yes followed with the word, but. Yeah. So even though we are in agreement, we always have to either add something or tweak something or change something to make sure we don't give up too much ground. Mm -hmm. And, and that comes with thinking you have so much knowledge and you don't need to let the love of God supersede. Yeah. So your, yeah. your debate issue with Democrats and who won the debate, yeah, we, we, don't, we want to agree, but we still want to agree in a positive light. Yeah. Even if we have a spirit of, try, of camaraderie and trying to, right. uh, to, to walk away you know, on, on good playing field, and, we want to hold on to that aspect of our pride. Yeah, but I'm really the right one. And, and that's human nature. Goodness, that's human nature for right. 
Uh, for me, but it is. You, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time trying to prove why I'm right. I mean, I spend, you know, 20, 30 minutes on a Sunday morning trying to express why my ideas about Scripture are right. Um, but I, I, I try to be really careful uh, to make sure that that's not really what's at the very heart of my message. I want the very heart of my message simply just to point to the one that I don't know fully, but who knows me. And that's a job is christians is because i got i have not figured out god yet i mean <laughs> if you hire me because you you know i, I i'm hopefully well versed in scripture and i hope that i have a you know my grounding on my understanding of god i can share it convey it encourage help build up but uh, uh i have a lot to learn and i guess that's what real education to me is you know david you're an educator that uh uh, education is not necessarily telling someone what they need to know. It's really opening their eyes to how much is out there to know, to pursue. And that's how my college uh, professors showed it to me as far as that. I kind of, I thought I was pretty smart in high school and I had a lot of stuff figured out. I was a teenage boy. Of course I did. Uh, and I was even good at school. So that helped too. Then, you know, I, you know, I had so much figured out. And one of my, one of my favorite professors now, um, he was a young professor, and those are some of the worst. Uh, and he and he was a oh man. He was tough. Gospel of John, um, among also some other ones. But the very first day of class, he said, "I'm here not to show you what you need to know. I'm here just to prove how much you don't know." And uh, that and and boy, we'd get our papers back, and they'd be bleeding from the red ink. I mean, just he would mark up every single thing that we had missed, or you know, not taking into account, and resources and sources we hadn't used. You know, our research we hadn't done as thoroughly as we could have, you know, like there's so much more out there than your small little perspective. And that was his goal. And I'd say he did it pretty well. Um, but that kind of just is in my mind that that's what a real education is, is, is you don't figure out how much you don't know. That, that That's the a mark of wisdom. And I think that would be more a mark of humility and love that Paul would want them to pursue here. It's uh, not not a matter of being right. It's a matter of um, how you regard one another, because that's the most important right you can have. Like you look at the other person as an image bearer of God. You look at some as someone whom Christ died for down in verse 10, which we're going to get to, verse 11, sorry. You know, that the, the person that you are transgressing against thinking that you are right is actually someone Christ died for. That's the truth. And that's the truth you have to let soak into, you know, who you are so much more than just your idea of what you think is right. So let's keep reading. Um, verses four through seven. Who wants the next part? And my translation actually breaks the paragraph at seven, but I think seven, I would have changed the paragraph myself differently. Let's go and read verses four to seven. Okay, go ahead then. So this is what I say about eating meat. We know that an idol is really nothing in the world, and we know that there is only one God. It is really not important if there are things called gods in heaven or on earth, and there are many of these gods and lords out there. For us, there is only one God, and he is our Father. All things came from him, and we live for him. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things were made through him, and we also have life through him. But not all people know this. Some have, some have had the habit of worshiping idols. So now when they eat meat, they still feel as if it belongs to an idol. They are not sure that it is right to eat this meat. So when they eat it, they feel guilty. But food will not bring us closer to God. Refusing to eat does not make us less pleasing to God, and eating does not make us closer to him. Thank you. All right. We, and here he gets into the heart of the disagreement. Food sacrifice to idols. That some were eating the food sacrifice to idols because... And you call it a god, I call it a prime rib, you know, and that would, that would, that would have been my approach. It's like, <laughs> absolutely, bring on the meat. Um, and and some were doing it just fine. I, and there's debate on whether it was the Jews who had this issue more, or the Gentiles who had this issue more. And I think in this particular passage, it seems like uh, the, uh, the Gentiles are maybe used to worship these gods, uh, by these idol festivals were the ones here in this moment that uh, would maybe be uh, defiled um, by their uh, transgressing their conscience. Um, but Paul 
emphasizes, we all know that, you know, from our perspective, there's only one God. Uh, he gets into chapter 10 and uh, the, the, the demonic aspect of these potential false gods that are out there and uh, to be wary of that. But here he just emphasizes, we know there's only one God. You know it, I know it. And so that, that is a truth. That, that is, you know, a, a true statement. There is only one God. And this is something we hold to firmly from the biblical witness and from the witness of Jesus himself. Uh, you know, that the greatest command is actually pre preceded by, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And, and so this is ingrained in us and should be. And so this is as true a notion as we can hold on to. There's only one God. And the logical application of that would be, yeah, so meat's meat. If it's sacrificed to an idol, whoop de doo Just somebody laid it on a rock and prayed to their little tiny rock god, and uh, so be it. It still tastes really good. Um, I, I, Paul's saying, yeah, that, that would be a logical conclusion to draw, but the logical conclusion we draw from our truth is not the thing that we're going to base what we, it's not our motivation, I think. Here, he's talking about motivation here, that we can connect the dots and make our case, so to speak, and even be true and right. And yeah, that, that makes sense. And that is the way that it works. There's only one God. But Paul is saying, but before you take that next step of applying your rightness, and especially applying it on top of somebody else who maybe even doesn't share that rightness, because maybe they've been afraid of these, all these little gods in the temples their whole life, he says, well, realize something about God. God cares about people. And so before you pat yourself on the back that you're right, the question is, do you care about people? And that's the Christian way, obviously. That, that is the Christian uh, philosophy that we adhere to, because it's Christian philosophy Christ adhered to, that cares about people because they're made in the image of Christ, made in the image of God, and someone that Christ died for. So um, any thoughts on that section as far as uh, um, that tension? Uh, in the early church with uh, eating food, sacrificed idols, and maybe even what some of those tensions could potentially look like in our day, like what would be a modern day food sacrificed to idol? Changing the order of our worship. <laughs> the way we do things, the way we do things becomes uh, you can't change it. You do three songs instead of two or whatever. Uh, that's, that's hard on the memory. I go back to the, the church we went to when we got married and they started, uh, they wanted to do Mike Singers and you had this battle within the church and it seemed like it was okay if I felt like I was the strong brother and those others were the weak. I'm fine with that, but I'm not really comfortable with saying I, um, I think that's a little bit tough. And then the other struggle I have on top of that is being held hostage by someone who clings to their weakness. So yeah. they don't know, not everyone knows this, but over time we're supposed to grow. So as a body, sometimes I think we have some, we can have people who are clinging to their weakness and not willing to grow through it. Mm -hmm. Thus, we don't get to, we, we don't get to express something different or whatever we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, and uh, I actually wanted to get into, I guess, how that conception of strong and weak really does um, get twisted, I guess, sometimes, or, or how this approach might get misused. Uh, and to do that, let's go ahead and finish. I'll read verses um, uh, 8 and to the end of the chapter. Uh, now food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, no better if we do. 
But be careful that this liberty of yours does not become a hindrance to the weak. For if someone weak sees you who possess knowledge dining at an idol's temple, will not his conscience be strengthened, quote unquote, to eat food offered to idols? So by your knowledge, this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed. If you sin against your brothers or sisters in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. For this reason, if food causes my brother or sister to sin, I will never eat meat again so that I may not cause one of them to sin. Uh, so yeah, the, this, the play of the, the weak and the strong and the idea that the strong should, and this is another other passages as well, give up their rights or privileges or preferences at least for on behalf of the weak because um, I think this is true of so many places in scripture. People are more important than issues. Um, I think that should be a beckon just theme of our Christian faith is you no, know, we have issues and the issues will come up and they continue to come up and they change over time and get twisted and redone and uh, and, and so the issues that the church is facing 100 years ago aren't necessarily the same issues we're facing now because cultures change. And so the issues are faced with change, but our clarion consistency that we should hold on to is uh, as we face issues, we still hold on that no one issue is ever going to be as important as the fact that God calls us to love one another as we would love ourselves and, that, and hold on to that truth of bringing them other people closer to God. And that doesn't just mean with open our hands, I'll do whatever you want to do, I don't think. I mean, we are called to repent and to call others to repent. And, but it's all out of that motivation of I care about them, not I care about the issue. And I think that's where a lot of the issues we, we have come from is that we, we build up the issue so much, we forget that it's the people that count. Now, of course, what or to respond to your comment, Eric, about you know the, the weak and the strong, I would say let's look at the characteristics, or maybe how would you describe the weak person here in the end of chapter eight? Right? When you read these last verses of chapter eight and see him talking about the weak person, what would be a how would you think of them? Or what 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 would come to mind as far as how you would describe this person that's identified as weak? Sometimes it's not weak because of years and years and years of being in the church weak, but maybe it's just a new convert weak. Yeah, yeah. that's someone who hasn't matured. Right, 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 right. And then you can have an old, an old dog that just hasn't stretched. And so there's, there's difference there. Of who's who might be being offended, um, yeah, and and that's a key word too. As far as offended, um, what's our usual response when we get offended? Well, usually, hey, why don't you just grow up? <laughs> <laughs> we, it's we, my freedom. It's my freedom, <laughs> and I'm going to do it. And that is where Paul is talking previously. Your knowledge is destroying, and love should override and that is yeah it's all backing up what it was said in the first of the chapter you've got to have love for those people and not bull your way through because it's my right yeah. I, and, and, and i'm, I'm gonna do it did you freeze up there you go all right uh it's hard oh. to know in this medium where there's the delay and sometimes the hitch in the connections as far as, uh, but yeah, we, we think, okay, a person, and, and the normal response is offended, we get aggressive, we get defensive, we get belligerent, you know, we wanna, and, and the weak person here is not saying, hey, you have to listen to me. The weak person here is actually very passive. The weak person here is simply watching looking and trying to learn from their example, the Christian examples around them and are, and, and they're not, I mean, they don't shout out from the back pew or whatever. You can't eat that food sacrifice to idol. It offends me here. There's, right. they say, oh, if it's okay for you, it must be okay for me. And, 
and and so they're not being aggressive and so the person who's aggressive um i mean you think about how jesus dealt with the weak and i'm thinking of sometimes that weak person was a prostitute or a tax collector or a um you know an adulterer um and he tenderly and gently and tried to help them along. And that's kind of a picture of what it looks like to love those who are especially different from us. Right. But, uh, but you look at how he dealt with the Pharisees and he didn't say, oh, you Pharisees who don't like what I'm doing, you're complaining, you must be weak. Okay, I'll give in. That's, I mean, giving in to complaining or giving in to people that are say, who just say I'm offended is actually not the example Christ gives us. What Christ says is you do what's right on behalf of other people. And if some people don't like that, yeah, tell them to. But um, that's where that's where Christ's knowledge superseded saying, listen, guys, you're you're wrong. And truth is right. Truth yeah. is right. And yeah. so and it, and like they, you said earlier, like we talked about, they go together because the, the, the truth that the Pharisees normally combated against was, how dare you eat with those sinners? How right. dare you, you know, participate or heal a person on the Sabbath? And Jesus said, oh, people are more important than the Sabbath. Uh, sorry you missed that when you read your Bible, but you know, they're made in the image of God and the <laughs> Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that whole discussion, but uh, again, the Pharisees were complainers, but Jesus did not say, oh, you're weak, I'll give in. So I think, I think that plays into Eric's question, you know, and how do we balance that? Well, for one, if we are trying to help people that need help and serve those that need to be served and to reach out with love to those who need to be reached out with, if that brings us complaining, if that brings people that say, I don't like that, um, then we say, well, I'm sorry you don't like that, but we're following the example of our Lord. So um, take it up with him if you don't like the fact that we're showing love to everyone that we you know, can possibly show love to. Uh, but this food sacrifice to idols is not on the surface, doesn't look like anything to do with love, but Paul's actually saying, oh, it does. Because are you thinking that the meat or the issue or your preference is more important than people. If, that, if that's, if that's where you come through with the conclusion of your think thought process that, you know, Oh, I get to eat meat because I'm entitled to eat meat and I like meat. And I'll, right. you know, and they do it really good down at the Zeus temple. It's medium rare. It's perfect. You know, those Zeus priests really know how to cook up a good steak. And so that's much better than, you know, the, those Israelites char the thing to death, but uh, I, I like mine a little bit. I mean, I'm obviously being facetious here, but <laughs> we, uh, you know, we, we think, well, this is what I want. And if Paul says, if that's your driving motivation, hold up. But if your driving motivation like Christ is, I'm looking out for other people, then don't hold up and run with it. And don't let the complainers and the naysayers and those that even, you may even think, well, maybe they're just weak. Well, uh, they, uh, are actually just wanting their way. And that's a big, big difference. Um, yeah, KT? Yeah, um, I have a question, but I have a statement after that. Okay. And then you can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a question that I'm gonna, I don't know, what's the opposite of a preface? I don't know. Anyway. Preface. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. So my question is, you know, the example that Eric gave here was that of, you know, like, changing the order of worship and I, I think that's very much something that if you weren't thinking it before you said it i'm surprised right like that's kind of where we go with stuff like this is like the color of the carpet order of worship Which and it all has to do it all has to do with like the group assembly is like mm. instantly where we go with this and, and maybe that's kind of correct like as you said this was kind of their tradition of going to the anyway so I heard a story a while back about my great grandfather and he was an elder in this little town, Edgewood, Texas, not far from here, Edgewood church of Christ. And he became an elder there and he used to smoke, uh, you know, like the Randy Travis song, old stogies. Anyway, <laughs> he used to smoke some cigars 
on a pretty regular basis. Mm -hmm. And after he became an elder, uh, he was standing outside one Sunday. He'd always head right out the back door and go stand in the, in the yard there and, and talk to people while he was smoking a cigar. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he went out there and he, he lit it up. And the story goes that this young new convert came up to him. Uh, he was kind of a, you know, a wild guy before. And, you know, he'd finally come to Christ and stuff through friends and everything. And he just walked up to him and he said, hey, man, you know, like, I find it kind of hard for, for me to, to see you doing that, you know, because he, he felt as though that was something like tobacco stuff was something he had to give up. You know, it was like yeah, kind of like a food sacrificed idol situation for him. Yeah. And he, he just mentioned that to him. And I don't know that I would have had <laughs> the wherewithal to do what my great grandfather apparently did. He took that stogie, he threw it on the ground, he stepped on it and he never touched him ever again. Yeah. And, and I think of that situation and I think, man, that to me more so maybe than the situation we brought up earlier of a collective we doing this whatever we're doing because mm -hmm. i think that's totally something where it's like we as a collective are simply trying to please god the best we can as well as be the most effective we can be when we're together whereas that's a, that's an example i think of my great grandfather choosing not to eat the food sacrifice with the idols you know yeah. it, he yeah. really likes cigars but God bless him for, for even doing something like that, where he said, you know, if it's really something that hurts you, I appreciate you telling me so that I couldn't, I could help you, you know? And so anyway, my question then would be, is that really like, is, is worship, you know, like talking about worship, is that really what our modern day equivalent of this is, or is it stuff like that story? Anyway, I think Roger I mean, has end up. But. I, I think that there's a application of, both ends of it personally um that again paul is trying to pull back this confrontation this issue in corinth uh that was other places too and he says you know before you just go off on who's right and who's wrong who matters and the answer is everybody matters and especially the strong can and should try to help the truly weak uh, not just the complainers, and that's sometimes a hard line, but I'll say if we can show love to somebody as the solution to the issue we're facing or the argument we're having or the dispute that's there, and that, you know, I, I think your grandpa's awesome story as far as, you know, did he have to give it up? I don't know. Or, the, you know, is that the only way that I, yeah. I don't, I don't know the, the exact necessary thing, but I know that God was happy that he loved his brother. Uh, I think he made God proud in that moment, you know, regardless of tobacco use and not tobacco use and all that. Uh, and I think when it comes to church assemblies, like Eric was talking about, same true. It's like, well, who's right, who's wrong about, you know, the best way to worship? Well, the person that comes to that with, I love you more than I love how many songs we sing or I love you more than how much I love, you know, the particular kind of, um, you know, worship styles we might do. Now, again, saying that, that doesn't give carte blanche to anybody to say, well, I don't like it. Everybody has to stop. It's, well, no, if we're, if we're collectively doing things out of love for one another, we don't stop anything. Um, because, but we should always check that motivation whenever there's disputes and make sure we're always getting back to that core motivation that should um, hold us, I guess, pure. Um, and Because there's different ways to do it. Um, I was thinking of a story I'd heard, an interesting story, and it was a non-Church of Christ um, guy that told me this, but his church kind of did this hashtag, love does the unexpected. And he told the story of this lady that, uh, you know, trying to get his church to think outside the box. How can we show love to our neighbors in unexpected ways? And actually, the same guy that told the story about the church helping the uh, AIDS community in Dallas that I talked about a week or two ago. But he had another story of this lady at his church that noticed that the lady across the street from her hardly ever saw her anymore, didn't see her husband at all, figured things had gone bad. And the lady would occasionally bring out these big bottles of, um, oh, uh, what's the Canadian whiskey? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 that's, a, that's a trick. Uh, 
There uh, it is. He almost got you. <laughs> <laughs> almost. No, <laughs> uh, uh, whatever the Canadian whiskey is. And, uh, like she saw a few, and so she said, what can I do for this lady? And so she actually went and bought a bottle of this Canadian whiskey, walked up to this lady's door and said, I, I know it doesn't seem, it seems like you're in maybe a little bit of a rough place. And uh, I've never drank before, but you know what? You can pour me a glass of this and I'll drink it with you and let's just talk. And the lady broke down in tears, opened up her life story and the fact that her husband had left her. And, uh, and in that moment, he's like, well, drinking might cause somebody to stumble. But I say, man, it, in that moment, she's showing love. And again, I'm not going to judge that, uh, whatever I might do. If that was done with the motivation of reaching out to her neighbor to maybe open up a possibility to have a conversation where she can exhibit the love of Christ. So all these situations we've got, can we work out in so many different ways? And part of this whole coronavirus, the, the, the back and the, the forth of everybody, you know, and you have different ones on different sides, different perspectives. And yeah, there's different ways of looking at it. I mean, and, you know, we've discussed that, you know, together, and I'm sure, and everybody's discussing it too. You know, and like in this sense, who would be the weak? Well, there's lots of different weak. There's the weak physically and the aging and the vulnerable, but there's the weak financially and those that, you know, and, and so, man, how do we handle that? Well, I don't know, but can we show love? And can we extend that hand of love as our prime motivation of I love you more than the issue that is upon us. And so we're going to get through it. We're going to work through it. And, um, uh, and, and that to me is a boldness, no matter what we talked about some weeks ago, and that's a boldness that really as Christians, we were made or remade in the image of Christ just to do like, you know, everybody else, their boldness is in, I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. You're wrong because then proving our points and laying it out. But if our boldness is, I'm going to show you as much love as I know how to show you. And, and, and that's, a, and, and that, that's a, a difficult thing to, to maneuver, but if that's our motivation, I think right. it'll make our, our father happy. Go ahead, David. I, I, uh, I guess I've always just thought of the scripture, not in the worship. I, somehow it, it never tied into me as that's a worship scripture. A guy goes and buys supper at the market where they bought meat that had been offered as a sacrifice. I, I, I didn't, I, I, don't, I get, maybe I'm not putting two plus two that they were in the worship and then they come home with the sacrifice. I always took it that somehow he went, somebody just went and picked up supper and it wasn't Brookshire's chicken. It was the temple meat. Yeah. That, and, and that's, that's my the point. Way. Yeah. I guess that's what I see. And so offense would be not in a worship sense, but it's what are we doing in our life and at jobs that people say, and you call yourself a Christian? Right. That, that makes more sense to me as who am I offending at work by the way I talk or the way I dress or the way I, how I treat other people. Absolutely. Uh, I just never tied that one as a worship scripture, but how I, we act. I totally agree, David. Like, I, I think that if you read it in that context, it's it's not a worship scripture, right? Like, it's not specifically a worship scripture, kind of like we're talking about. I think what I've experienced growing up Church of Christ is this is always thrown at the person that starts talking about, hey, maybe we can have communion after the sermon, <laughs> I don't. I don't know how that verse gets drug in. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Right. I totally. Well, we agree. think, oh no, it might offend, and so we can't do it, and we use that as our base. And like that was never Jesus's base. And actually, that's one thing I wanted to tie in as well. I guess before we finish up, uh, is uh, where did I have it? Um, Romans chapter nine, verses thirty-two and thirty-three. Somebody want to read that real fast? While you're looking for that, Kobe, I'm going to share one. Yeah, go ahead, Roger. You had your hand up a few times. Sorry. Yeah. That, well, I've always studied this passage and thought of the, the statement Paul made that he became all things to all men, that by all means he would be able to reach someone that was lost. But the real issue here 
was influence. And the things that we do in the marketplace and in the downtown and whatever, what we do has an impact on other people's lives. And depending on their spiritual maturity, right? some people it's okay and some people it offends. I was visiting with a friend here in town just a few weeks ago and and he was telling me the story about his mother and he's he's a member of the Baptist church and he said I don't know what she would do today to buy groceries because she would not shop at Brookshire's because they sell alcohol now she would never go into any business that served alcohol and you know today you can't hardly go to a restaurant that doesn't and so you know I can tell you from my raising, it took a while for me to be okay with that. It, it bothered me to go into the restaurants that served alcohol thinking, what do people think? And so, and, and this passage has probably influenced that thinking. And, I'm, and where we're going to get to in Romans 9 and where we're going to finish up here. I think speaks to that a little, but I would say that again, we have to be careful not to correlate easily offended with weak. Yes. And I would also uh, say that as far as uh, the food sacrifice, that this talking about making people stumble, not, not just making them a little bit, you know, oh, I'm a little bit upset about that. Like, well, this is actually, he used the word destroy, you destroy right. Christ, Christ died. That's right. And so, what I guess. A food sacrifice idol I kind of see potentially in our context is media. Um, you know, that someone might say, well, I can watch stuff with that kind of stuff in it, you know, with, you know, whether it be nudity, sex, you know, or, you know, some of the stuff that uh, we not just find offensive, but I'm saying, you know, some of that can really destroy honestly like to say well hey sit here and watch it with me and it's like well you know i mean i've I'm, I'm known some many, many in churches you know who think they you know well, a movie with a little this scene or that scene's okay and and i have a little bit of trouble with that um but the bigger trouble i have is well you have to be careful because you have a lot of people around you who maybe it's not okay with and 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 well especially is, you know, who, what are you inviting others to participate in with you? And, uh, and we have to be very careful of stuff that would tear down and, and, and things that would infect and spread that bad leaven and that bad yeast. Yes. Uh, not, not just make somebody upset. That's a, to me, a very uh, different it, issue. It's but about, I, it's about, taking someone who has a weakness and, and putting them in a situation where that they're overcome with that weakness. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why he's saying you, you cannot do that. Um, no. and, and nor should we, but as far as offensive and stumbling, I mean, this word offensive, a rock to stumble. Um, it's interesting how it's used in Romans 9, 32 and 33. Somebody want to read that? Whoever has turned to it. And then we'll close there, I think. Chapter 8. Chapter 8 or chapter 9? Uh, chapter 9, verses 32 and 33. Oh, 32, 33. All right. Why not? Because they pursued it, not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written... See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So I think this helps balance our understanding of the stumbling over in 1 Corinthians. Because he says, don't, don't put a rock to trip up your brother right in front of him. And, no, and we should not. However, if they're stumbling over... The truth. Christian principle and truth of this is what's right. Because, I mean, you know, the, the cross was foolishness to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews. Uh, because the Jews thought, 
I can't believe in a Messiah that died on a cursed tree because God's anybody who dies on a tree is going to be cursed. And so, and it was this huge, the fact that the Messiah would die at all was crazy or to be killed by a foreign power, foreign government. And so a huge stumbling block and the Christianity said, yeah, God put it there. <laughs> God let, uh, it's scandalous, especially the idea that, oh, Gentiles can become Christians too. That was a huge stumbling block for the Jews. Uh, Gentiles can be approved by God and God says, absolutely can, you know, you might trip over that. You can either pick yourself up, back up and keep walking, or you can choose a different path. And if you choose a different path, that's on you. I'm not going to. So the stumbling blocks that God puts there, which are based on we all have access to the Father and we all have access to grace and that we all have the chance of forgiveness. We all have um, you know, the opportunity for Christ to make us one people. And, and and you think about the stumbling block that that may be created uh, whenever there's you know was much more stronger lines of racism you know in our past and telling me that uh, a black Christian is just as good as a white Christian and I would say well if that offends you I'm sorry be offended um, <laughs> uh, and because that's very much you telling me the Gentile Christian is just as good as a Jewish Christian and Paul says well that offends you be offended. Because that's why God purposely made it. Uh, and so God has put this stumbling block, so to speak, because we have in a hierarchy of who's more important, who's more right, who has more pedigree, who, and, and all those are how the world works. And so it's offensive to our mindset to say, you know what? God loves every single sinner out there the same. And if that offends you, that offends me, Paul would say coldly, be offended. Um, that, that is an inherent core of this message that we submit to. But here, here's what you don't do. You don't throw out extra stumbling blocks just because you want your way uh, to your fellow brothers whom Christ did die for that are just as important as you. So you don't, I'm not entitled to lay down stumbling blocks uh, for my own benefit. But I can sure say, you know what, the ones that God put in place those are the ones I'm going to stand on, actually. I'm going to stand on those stumbling rocks, stumbling blocks, and that's what the last line there in verse 33 says. The one who believes in him will not be put to shame. So the rock that made others fall is the rock we build our faith on. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, I think that helps, us, helps me at least process. It's not about being offended. It's more about am I making people stumble or is God having people stumble because they won't accept his truth and if the second is true okay uh but if the first is true simply because i want my way paul mm -hmm. says check yourself and, and right. it's still a hard balance that the role but the overall motivating factor that helps us is you love them now if you can if you can hate them in the core of who you are you're not right you may think you're right but you're not right because you're not as in the love of god and uh, you might pity them. You might be sad for them. You might be heartbroken because they are choosing to walk a path that is not the way God designed or desired. But um, if, it, if you're motivated simply out of pride or hate, no. that's not the truth of God. So. Well, yeah, I I Any other comments before we finish up? I appreciate everybody's comments. Colby, I got, I got one thing I was thinking about earlier. Uh, I hate to go all the way back to verse three and stuff, but and uh, chapter in, eight. in first Corinthians eight, yeah, where it says, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And that kind of conversation we had about like the, diff the opposites of love and knowledge, and it's not opposites per se, it's both. And, and I, as soon as we started talking about that, I thought about Jesus in John chapter, chapter 17, praying for his followers and praying for unity, praying that they might <laughs> love one another as, as God fully loves himself and all that. And what he said there in, you know, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And to know that if we love God, if, if that's our primary focus, right? Like love, love is the greatest thing. Like knowledge is right there next to it. But if love is the greatest thing, then, then I'm going to love Jesus and I'm going to want to know more about him. I'm going to want to follow and be more like him. And if that's the case, then I'm going to be in his word. 
and God is going to sanctify me to where I'm going to look at myself before I even get in a situation, right? Like, I guess that's kind of what Paul's hitting at here is like, you're not allowing the word of God to really seep in to where it permeates you and, and helps you to love the way you ought to. It's like, you're, you're reading this like it's a textbook. It's not what it is. <laughs> you know, like these are, these are kind of like marching orders for somebody who has been loved and in return also loves God. And so anyway, yeah. that's just where my mind went earlier and I thought I'd add it. But, yeah. And I appreciate it. And anyway. uh, maybe think of something else, but now it's gone. So maybe I'll get back to it. Some other time. <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, you, you were talking like, Ooh, and then it went away. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll think of it after we finish up. But, uh, yeah. but no, thank you, Katie. I think I think you are right that it's all about our perspective and changing that perspective ra- rather than just making sure we're right. It's like, well, I'll be examining the corporate we are. Oh, what's our thing? Uh, uh, Peter. Now, Peter following Jesus in so many instances was not right. I mean, he messed up again and again and again and got it wrong. And scripture showed us it's that. But you know what? Every time he came back and he says, help me understand better. You know, uh, or like the, um, uh, the, the man who wanted, uh, I think it was his daughter healed. And, and Jesus said, you know, about unbelief. And the man says, help my unbelief. I'm like, ooh, that's right. I mean, that's not a saying I'm right, but, but that's the right thing to do. Because that's saying, God, teach me. And, and that's what you're saying is like we're, we are coming to our master, coming to Jesus, sitting at his feet and saying, I'm here to learn, fill me up. And we're, that should be the attitude we go with, not you listen up, Jesus, and I'll tell you what it's about, uh, which maybe I've <laughs> come very close to being. <laughs> um, Peter kind of did the same thing, and I think I would be very much like it. Right. Good well, thank study, you. Toby. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody so who wants to close this out in prayer? I guess. KT, you took your hat off. So yeah, I mean, I guess I can. <laughs> I probably have the best connection here. So <laughs> let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for this avenue of communication we have to be able to have a Bible study, uh, even as we're in our own homes. And Father, right now, I know that uh, we're, court, we're recording this on a Monday, but it'll go up on Wednesday. And uh, Father, I just pray that you will bless any of those who, who watch it and who share in this study. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, it will be a tool to, to open up the word to others, that they may hear it. And Father, help them to believe and know you uh, all, all the more better. Father, thank you for... Uh, these couples here that I get to share this with and thank you for Colby for preparing these thoughts and, and guiding us through this message, Lord. Father, I pray that uh, each and every day that we will strive to be more like Jesus. And Father, I pray that that will come from a place of loving you and wanting to be more like him. Uh, Father, be with us this week. Be with us during this uh, time as we're separated for a few more weeks, God. I pray that um, everything will go smoothly and that we can meet again uh, real soon. Father, that you will bless our time together, uh, whether it's virtually or in person when we get to gather together again. Um, Father, help us to continue to love one another as you have loved us. We thank you so much for all your many blessings, Lord. We thank you most of all for Jesus and your Holy Spirit. It's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen.